I have so many things to say, and I hope I don't take too long to say them to you. I'm, I'm a writer, and so I've actually written what I want to say for two reasons. One, because I'm sure that you're much more interested in the way I write than in the way I speak. And second, because the things I have to say are complicated, dangerous things in these dangerous times, and I think we have to be very, very precise about what we're saying and how we say them and the language that we use. So I hope it's okay if I read it out to you. My talk today is called Come September. Writers imagine that they cull stories from the world. I'm beginning to believe that vanity makes them think so. That it's actually the other way around. Stories cull writers from the world. Stories reveal themselves to us. The public narrative, the private narrative. They colonize us, they commission us, they insist on being told. Fiction and non-fiction are only different techniques of storytelling. For reasons that I don't fully understand, fiction dances out of me, and non-fiction is wrenched out by the aching, broken world I wake up to every morning. The theme of much of what I write, fiction as well as non-fiction, is the relationship between power and powerlessness, and the endless circular conflict they're engaged in. John Berger, that most wonderful writer, once wrote, never again will a single story be told as though it's the only one. There can never be a single story. There are only ways of seeing. So when I tell a story, I tell it not as an ideologue who wants to pit one absolutist ideology against another, but as a storyteller who wants to share her way of seeing. Though it might appear otherwise, my writing is not really about nations and histories, it's about power, about the paranoia and ruthlessness of power, about the physics of power. I believe that the accumulation of vast, unfettered power by a state or a country, a corporation or an institution, or even an individual, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, regardless of ideology, results in excesses such as the ones I will recount here. Living as I do, as millions of us do, in the shadow of the nuclear holocaust that the governments of India and Pakistan keep promising their brainwashed citizenry, and in the global neighborhood of the war against terror, what President Bush rather biblically calls the task that never ends, I find myself thinking a great deal about the relationship between citizens and the state in India, those of us who have expressed views on nuclear bombs, big dams, corporate globalization, and the rising threat of communal Hindu fascism, views that are at variance with the Indian governments, are branded anti-national. While this accusation doesn't fill me with indignation, it's not an accurate description of what I do or how I think. Because an anti-national is a person who is against his or her own nation, and by inference is pro some other one. But it isn't necessary to be anti-national to be deeply suspicious of all nationalism, to be anti-nationalism. Nationalism of one kind or another was the cause of most of the genocide of the 20th century. Flags are bits of colored cloth that governments use, first to shrink wrap people's brains, and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. Arundhati just said to me, uh, well, we can now talk about the things that I left out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess... <laughs> <laughs> what did you leave out? <laughs> you know, I, I was sitting there listening to you, and thinking, there it was, <laughs> there it is. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to. You don't want me to say anything let's nice about no. <laughs> okay, no. But really, uh, what uh, what I thought I was sitting there is uh, it was this mastery of detail, 
all expressed in the most poetic and beautiful way. That combination is so hard to achieve. I know this is not a lead-in to a conversation. <laughs> it's just, it's a final statement. <laughs> you see. But, uh, but I... Uh, but let, let me ask you this, Arundhati. Uh, how did you come to decide, you know, <coughs> after writing The God of Small Things, that you were not going to immediately sit down and write another novel? Well, I actually, I would have had to decide to sit down and write another uh. novel. In that, I never, you know, I mean, I've never believed in this thing of having a single profession and sort of doing it, doing the same thing all your life. It feels like your brain is growing in one direction, you know, like some tumor. Mm. <laughs> and I, I never, I, you know, a, lo a lot of people keep saying to me that you must be under a lot of pressure from your publishers to write another book. Well, I think that's, a, I mean, it's a bit dishonest to put it that way for me because no, no one can pressurize me, you know. I mean, they don't have a handle on me. It's only if, if I wanted to accept that pressure that it would be a pressure. And I, I, I just think that um, <clears throat> very soon, actually, very soon after I finished writing The God of Small Things and it came out, um, India did, you know, its nuclear tests, and, and I, 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 re I recognized the fact that here was the, you know, the papers and lots of public people and writers and painters and everybody was standing up and applauding this horrible act. Mm -hmm. And I realized then that you know, staying quiet was as political an act as speaking out, and I had the space to make a statement. And if I didn't, it was something that I couldn't live with, which was when I wrote The End of Imagination. <laughs>